Uh, I did this in the first service too, and he, he's not here this time, but I wanted to make sure to let you all know that today, this very day, uh, 27 years ago, the student minister here at St. Albans, Philip Mullins, uh, was born. So it's Philip's birthday today, and so uh, make sure when you see him after, seek him out even maybe, uh, make sure you find him and tell him, wish him a happy birthday, uh, and then you can, whatever God puts on your heart, a car, uh, I, I don't know, whatever you want to give him uh, or not give him, uh, it's up to you. But hey, uh, it's good to be here this morning. And we've been going through uh, our Heroes of the Faith series. And uh, it's a unique sort of series because each speaker gets to choose their own hero. And so you may uh, end up with somebody uh, preached here that's not preached to the other place. And so it's just kind of a cool uh, a cool series all together. And so for this week, I have chosen the, uh, the prophet Elijah out of the book of First Kings. And so if you have your Bible with you, you can go ahead and turn to First Kings 17, and we're going to be reading from there in just a little bit, uh, and we'll also have it up on the screen for you if you don't have your Bible with you. But Elijah is an example of intense faith and prayer. He's from a place called Tishbe, and most people don't even know where that is. Uh, the best guess is he's just a hillbilly from somewhere in the woods, and I felt like that would play nicely to this crowd. Uh, I feel like he's just a West Virginian, you know, like he's just West Virginia in his blood. And so uh, his name means my God is Yahweh, which is kind of perfect. Like it's the perfect name for what he's about to do. It, sometimes that happens. Sometimes a name perfectly describes the profession that somebody picks, like a dentist uh, named Toothman or a banker named Cash Dollar, and you look at that and you think, whoa, did that person become that because of their name? Like, were they destined to be a dentist from birth because of their name? Like, that's amazing. Another cool thing about Elijah was he was quite the athlete. Uh, we see later on in his story, he ran 17 miles, this is Jeff Ranson territory, uh, he ran 17 miles from Carmel to Jezreel, and he outran horses and chariots in the process. Like, take that, Usain Bolt. Like, this guy was fast. He was quite the athlete. You know, Elijah's story, it's similar to, to Moses. Uh, Moses, in his story, he challenged Pharaoh, and Elijah, he challenged a guy named King Ahab. And both went eastward after challenging this wrathful king. Both uh, lived on God's abundant provision of bread, water, and meat. Both went to a place called Mount Horeb for 40 days and 40 nights to appear before God. Both became discouraged, and, and they needed the assurance of God to complete their mission. And both felt the burden of failure so much that they ended up desiring to die. And Elijah, he actually appears with Moses at the transfiguration of Jesus in Matthew chapter 17 in the New Testament. That's not all, though. Elijah was also like John the Baptist, and he's associated with him in Luke chapter 1. Both come from obscure places. They both dress similarly, which is to say they both dress weird. They both looked weird. And both called people to repentance. And both were forerunners to Jesus. They laid the groundwork for Jesus, both of them. But most of all, he's like these other people, but most of all, he was a man like you and I. How many, of you would, how many of you have ever come into contact with a, a celebrity or a musician or an athlete of some sort and like your, your demeanor immediately, you, you freeze up, you get starstruck? Anybody like that? You know, when I was about 11 or 12, my family and I, we went to St. Louis, Missouri for a few days and my family, they're big fans of the Cardinals, which for the sports impaired is the, uh, is the baseball team in St. Louis. But we went to the city there, and we went to see some of the sites, like the Gateway Arch. But most of all, we went just to see a couple of games uh, at the Cardinals' home stadium. And so this, my family, they weren't big on vacations. Like, this was the farthest we ever went. It was the biggest trip we ever took. So this was a big deal, at least to me at that age. Anyway, the Cardinals, they're playing the Cincinnati Reds this, that week. And, and one night after, after the Cardinals had won, my brother and I are back at the hotel. We've been there for a little bit. We take the elevator down to the lobby to do who knows what. But as we're stepping off the elevator, we pass a group of Cincinnati Reds players heading onto the elevator. And right there in front is future Hall of Fame shortstop Barry Larkin. And I recognize him immediately, and I start, like, hitting my brother, and I'm like, hello, that was Barry Larkin. We got to do something about this. Like, we got to talk to him or something, get his autograph. And my brother, calm and cool, he's like, oh, no, no. They just lost. They're mad. They don't want to talk to anyone. Anybody ever have a Debbie Downer brother or sister like that that's just like, no, no, it, let's not be fun. 
<laughs> like, my, my brother is, is nine years older than me, so at that age, I was like, yes, sure. Like, I just accepted it. But when I think about that now, I think, man, what a missed opportunity. He totally would have signed a baseball or something. But what stuck out most to me about that experience was after the game, those guys are just like us. Off the field, off the, the court, whatever it is, they're just like you and I. And for the first time, I realized that, yes, they do stay in a hotel. I don't know where they, th- I think they stayed before, but they stay in hotels with everybody else. They go to restaurants just like everybody else. And that's actually why I think that people enjoy following celebrities or athletes or whatever on Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat, or whatever you follow people on, because we get to see a side of these people that we might not normally be able to see. And so it's a similar thing with Elijah as well. Here we see this hero of the Bible, what with his prophets of Baal defeat and and the chariots of fire, and and we sort of distance ourselves from him. We tell ourselves, my faith, it it can never be that strong. His is so much stronger than mine. I, I can never be like him. I mean, he's listed in the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11, alongside like Moses and Noah and these big titans of the Bible. How could I ever compare to a person like Elijah? Yet in James chapter 5, James tells us, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He's just like you and me. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. And so James wants us to know that every believer, dressed in the righteousness of Jesus, pursuing likeness to Jesus, all of us can have an effective prayer life just like Elijah does. Through the righteousness of Jesus, we can be confident that our prayers are heard by God just like Elijah's. And so as we go through the first part of Elijah's story this morning, I think that's an important thing to remember, that the same things that he prayed, we can pray too and know that God hears us. So if you have your Bible this morning, I wanted to take this opportunity to go through the chapter 17 of 1 Kings. And if you don't have your Bible, you can follow along up on the screen. Uh, And so we're going to start right in verse 1 and go right through it. So it starts out like this. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kareth ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook and I I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth ravine east of the Jordan and he stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the brook. Some time later the, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was gathering sticks. He called her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid, go home and do as you've said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. So she went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and for her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, and in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Some time later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse, and finally he stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my, son, my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child, carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. 
Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. Will you pray with me? Father, we're so thankful we can be here this morning, and that we can learn from the story of Elijah, and, and apply these lessons to our life, these lessons we're about to learn, and I just pray that you would uh, put the message that you want us to hear on our hearts. Ho I, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would come here and, and change us and affect us, that you would be in this room today, and that the message of God would come through loud and clear. In your name we pray, amen. So Elijah is like us, and we should seek to be like him. But how? Why, why, why should we be like, be like Elijah? Well, throughout chapter 17 of 1 Kings, Elijah, he teaches us about great faith and effective prayer. We, we find him standing boldly in the face of opposition. We find him praying for God to act on his word and for God to raise the dead and for God's glory to be known and people to repent. And so this morning, I think there are three lessons on prayer and faith that we can learn from Elijah. And the first one is that we can learn to believe what God has said. We see Elijah first introduced there in verse 1, and right off the bat, he's making a bold proclamation. And verse 1 says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead says to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. I mean, Elijah's not messing around, right? Like right out of the gate, he's going for it all. He's, to this evil king, he's going right to him and saying, It ain't going to rain until I say so. There won't even be dew on the ground. And that's not a statement you make unless you truly believe what God has said is true. I mean, this ain't just some guy on the street. This is the, the king that you're telling this straight to his face. Hey, it's not going to happen. And I think the context around that statement helps to show us just how bold of a statement it really was. And so as you read through First and Second Kings, you read about these kings of Israel and Judah, but uh, kings of Israel, and some of them follow God and, and they lead the people towards them. They follow his commandments and they, it says they did good in the eyes of the Lord. But more often than not, it says that these kings were evil and they did evil in the, uh, in the eyes of the Lord and caused the whole nation of Israel to sin. And during these times, we see idol worship and sexual immorality, and there's just not a whole lot of worship to God. But the king of Israel during Elijah's time, his name was King Ahab, and chapter 16 tells us that Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those that came before him. And when you read through this section, you're like, man, that was pretty evil. And throughout the Old Testament, the, the Israelites, they get angry with God when things don't go their way, and they begin to wash, worship these false gods. And one of the most popular options for them was a, was a god by the name of Baal. And Baal was known as the rider on the clouds, the god of rain and fertility, and because of this, the god of riches. And when you think about it, rain and fertility, they're saying this is where life comes from. And Baal's followers, they believed he restored life after the death of summer. And King Ahab, he was a huge supporter of Baal. And under his reign, for the first time, Baal is now state-sponsored. I mean, how evil do you need to be to be the king of Israel, the king over God's people, and you say, you know what, instead of God, we're going to worship Baal. And if that wasn't bad enough, Ahab is married to a woman named Jezebel. And this is a woman so evil, did so many evil things, that even today, when you hear the name Jezebel, you go, that's an evil person. And so Jezebel, she was an evangelist of Baal and actively sought to get rid of the prophets of the Lord, kill them off so there would be nothing standing in the way of Baal. But Baal wasn't the only God that the people followed. If there was no rain, the people would believe that Baal was submitting to the God of death until a later date when Baal would be revived. So it wasn't that he didn't exist. He's just not here right now. He's, he surrendered himself. He'll be back. And in this polytheistic culture, people chose their God kind of a la carte style. You ever go to the restaurant and take a little bit of this, a little bit of this? And so it's like, uh, I'll do a little bit of goddess worship over here, a little Baal worship over here. And, you know, just to be safe, I'll do a little Yahweh worship too. Exclusive worship of the one true God was absent in most places. And the people simply chose to worship the God that best served their needs. I'm just going to cover all my bases. The situation was so bad that Elijah says in chapter 19 that he is the only real worshiper left. Perhaps the most troubling part of the entire story of Elijah is in chapter 18 when Elijah, he challenges the people, look, follow God, follow Baal, but just pick one. 
I, I just pick one. You, gotta, you can't keep waffling back and forth. Pick one. Stop wavering on your opinions. And when he challenges them this, they say nothing. They can't even decide who to follow. All in all, it's a pretty lonely and discouraging position for Elijah. Imagine uh, you go into work and your boss said, hey, come over here. I have, we have an, an, a really exciting, important project for the company. And this is going to take us, man, light years into the future. And you want, I want you to be in charge of it. I'm going to give you a team of just awesomely skilled people. And you're, this is just going to be great for us. And so you go home and you're, you just be, oh, you're so excited. You begin thinking of ways to accomplish this task set before you. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm do this, I'm going to use these people, and you start utilizing the strength of your team. And, and you get excited about the prospects, prospects of success and what this is going to do for your company. Man, we're, this is going to be awesome. But when you walk into that first meeting with all of the people that you're now in charge of, all you see is a room of people who look like they would rather be anywhere but in that room right then. Nobody's paying attention to you. They're all on their phone. There's a conversation taking place in the corner between two people. And the only audible excitement that comes out of anybody is from this guy watching in the football game when his team scores a touchdown, right? Your passion and commitment to this project will most certainly be tested because of the apathy of the people. These people don't care. And so it's going to test you. And so maybe you feel the same way with your kids sometimes. You, you, you love them so much. You only want to, to see them succeed. And you only want to try to protect them. But they lash out at you or act out and do really dumb things. And it just kind of leaves you feeling helpless. I've got a two-year-old at home and I get frustrated when he won't listen because I'm trying to protect him. I deal with 16-year-olds with parents frustrated because they're just trying to protect them. My guess is that most of you will recognize this man by his nickname, the Unabomber. His real name is Ted Kaczynski, and he was found guilty of killing three people and wounding 24 more with pipe bombs through the mail from 1978 to 1995 because of his political beliefs. And it was at his trial that his mom spoke and tried to convince her son, just take responsibility for your actions. But he refused. He stubbornly refused, and he wouldn't even look at his mom. Her name is Wanda Kaczynski, and until her death in 2011, she would write a monthly letter to her son, and she always would end the letter with the same words. She would write, I want you to know, Ted, that when a child is born, the parents give them the gift of unconditional love for a lifetime. And this is true of you. No matter what happens, my love will be there for you for a lifetime. And the sad thing is, Ted never responded to his mother's words. And so just like Mr. Mrs. Kaczynski loved her son despite his mistakes, Elijah loved the Israelites and only wanted to see them return to God and stop their evil, sinful ways. But when they continue to fall away from God, Elijah, the only thing you can think to do is, I'm just going to have to lean on the promises of God to get through this. And so because he believes what God has promised, he proclaims it, telling the king, you know what, there's going to be no rain or dew on the ground until I say so. And Elijah's actually calling back to a promise from the book of Deuteronomy, which promised drought as a punishment for idolatry. This makes sense because the people, they were to rely on God alone for rain. And God promised that if they turned to another God, that he would withhold the rain. And in this specific instance, the judgment is even more fitting because giving rain was one of the things that Baal was supposed to do. So if you take away the rain, where's Baal at? So Elijah says that not only will it not rain, but there's not even going to be a drop of dew on the grass. This isn't just bad luck. It's not just it didn't rain for a couple weeks. Nothing. There will be no moisture whatsoever because of their idolatry. And Elijah believes so much in the promises of God that he proclaims it to the people, to the king, based solely upon what God has said previously. Notice God doesn't tell Elijah to say this. No, this is just Elijah recalling what had been promised as punishment already. Like when two siblings are left home alone with, with specific instructions, stay out of that room. The carpet is brand new. There's plastic on the sofa. Do not go in that room. But one of them decides to break the rules and ends up getting mud all over the carpet and the couch. You better believe if that happens, that other sibling is going to recall that punishment real quick, right? Oh, you're in trouble, right? 
And so Elijah believes so strongly in the word of the Lord that he boldly proclaims it to the king, that this is going to happen as punishment. And he also believes so much in what God has said that he prays it. Have you ever prayed a prayer that's just really hard to pray? That's what, that's the position that Elijah is in here. He loves these people unconditionally. He only wants them to come back to God, but realizes that the punishment God has promised may be the only way they come back to their creator. And so we see back in the passage we read from James earlier that Elijah actually prayed that it wouldn't rain. He didn't read that wrong. He says, I do, God, don't let it rain. And we often pray that God will keep his promises, but we just do the good ones, right? Like we pray that he's going to rescue us from our trouble or that the grace of Jesus is sufficient to save us, that one day there will be a place with no more pain or tears. But how often have you prayed that God will fulfill a promise of punishment? How often have you prayed the bad stuff? And one thing I think is important to see here is that Elijah is teaching us to pray according to God's word. A drought wasn't just something that Elijah thought up on his own. He wasn't asking God to do some cool tricks like, this would be a worthy punishment. No, he was boldly asking God to act on his word. And just because God promises something, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't pray about it. Our prayer life should go hand in hand with God's word. We should be praying the scripture and asking God daily to fulfill the promises of his word in our lives, even if that means praying those tough prayers. The second thing we can learn from Elijah is to trust God for our daily bread. So right after Elijah's bold proclamation, God tells him, hey, flee eastward and hide in a place called the Kareth Ravine for protection from King Ahab. God tells him that while he's there, he can drink water from the brook and the ravens will feed him. And that's exactly what happens. The ravens, they bring him bread and meat in the morning and the evening and he drinks from the brook and he's sustained. Elijah's needs are taken care of by God after he obeys him. And I'm sure there were questions that arose in Elijah's mind when God told him, hey, head eastward and... and and be protected. He has questions about how he's going to survive. I mean, he's a little concerned about this whole drought thing because, you know, he lives there too. So it's not like there's a little cloud following him around. Like, he's got to deal with this drought too. And then God tells him, hey, on top of that, there's going to be these ravens that feed you, which is weird. And it raises some more questions. But Elijah, he trusts God so much that he just goes along with it and blindly follows what God has told him to do. No complaining, no questions. I think there's a lot of times in our lives where we, would, where we worry about how our needs are going to be met. I mean, we worry like a lot about how things are going to work out. We worry a lot about the future. We spend a huge portion of our lives worrying about things that we really have no control over at all. And for most of us, if a God had told us to go into the middle of nowhere and rely on some birds to bring us food and a brook that isn't being replenished for our water, we'd be kind of stressed out about it. Anxiety level goes up a little higher, right? Like, how will the ravens know how to find me? Are you going to give me, like, a GPS, and there's going to be some kind of, like, call or something? Uh, what happens when the brook dries up, God? Like, there's a drought. I don't know if you knew, but there's a drought happening. And the most important, do they know I went gluten-free last week? Like, are they going to know? But seriously, we always look, like, ten steps ahead, and we worry how it's going to work out. Okay, God, I really see how you want me to do this, but, like, how's it going to work out? Because... I don't know, like I need to know what's the 10 step plan here. And in Matthew chapter six, Jesus teaches us not to worry about our basic needs because God, hey, he provides for the birds of the sky and the lilies of the field. And how much more does he love you? Who is his prized possession? It's you. So if he takes care of them, he's gonna take care of you too. Do not worry. And when Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray, right in the middle, it says, give us this day our daily bread, not yearly, monthly, weekly, no, daily bread. Go to him daily for your needs. We can trust God to provide for our daily needs. We're told to do so with the hope that if we trust him to care for our needs, then we won't be worrying about the rest. How much time do we waste worrying? Elijah trusted God to take care of his needs, and God provided. He came through. Might have been in a weird way, but he came through. In fact, God provided in more ways than just one. Eventually, the brook does dry up because of the drought. And God sends Elijah to a place called Zarephath, a place he had never been to meet a widow that he has commanded to supply him food. That's 
I mean, even more so. God, I don't understand. Like, there's this woman. I've never met her. I've never been to this place. How is she going to know who I am? How am I going to know who she is? Like, questions. But because God, Elijah trusted God to meet his needs, even when one door was closed, even when one thing dried up, another was open. And God may not always take care of you in the same ways, but he's always going to find a way. And so Elijah obeys, and he travels to Zarephath, and he meets this widow at the town gate, and he asks her for some bread and water. And she replies that she only has a little flour and oil left, and she's actually going to go home and make a final meal for her and her son before they die. Some dire times here. And Elijah tells her that if she will provide for him first, the Lord will provide for all of them. The widow obeys, and so it's in this moment that it's like, okay, you read that passage and you think, oh, God's taking care of Elijah. He's sending her here. But it may have been that God was caring for this widow to send Elijah there as well. Because when the, the widow obeys what Elijah has said, God provides them with food for every day that Elijah is there according to the word of the Lord. Again, when we trust the word of God, our needs are going to be met. And the third lesson we can learn from Elijah is to rely on the God who raises the dead. The Lord has so far protected Elijah from tragedy, providing for his needs, and he's kept him safe. But then we see tragedy strike in verse 17, not to Elijah, but to the son of the woman that he's been standing with. And he actually becomes so ill, it says he gets, he's sicker and sicker, and he eventually dies. And instantly, the widow turns around and blames Elijah, claiming that he's just been sent there to kill her son because of her sin. How many of you ever felt that way? How many of you ever felt that you experienced loss because of the sin in your life or the mistakes that you've made? Have you ever felt like you got sick or lost your job because, as punishment because of your sin, punishment from God. I think there are some in this room that can relate to this widow. I mean, we don't know much about her, but it's clear that she's lost her husband because she's a widow, and now she's lost her only child. And for anyone that's experienced trial after trial in your life, for anyone who just can't seem to catch a break, I think you can relate to this widow a little bit. And whether you're a Christian or not, it can feel like God is punishing you for your sin by taking away all the good things in your life. Notice Elijah's response, though. He, he doesn't confirm what she said. He doesn't scold her for feeling that way. He simply replies, give me your son. Elijah doesn't try to come up with the perfect answer or something that's just going to make her feel better. You know, sometimes when people come to us after experiencing some heartbreaking loss, we don't know what to say. We just wish we could say the one thing that would just make it all better. And that if we were closer with God, that we would have that. And so we get discouraged but Elijah does the only thing he knows how to do here. And he takes the boy upstairs and he begins to pray. And more than pray, he cries out to the Lord. Even for a righteous man like Elijah, his prayer wasn't full of fancy words. And it didn't contain all the answers or some understanding of God's purpose in the boy's death. Now Elijah takes his feelings to God in prayer and he prays in faith and desperation, questioning, why did you take the boy's life? Bring him back, Lord. It's clear that Elijah loves the boy and he's really torn up about this. So he pours his heart out to God in faith. And the amazing thing is, we see in verse 22 that God hears Elijah's plea for help and the boy's life returns and he lived. And sometimes I think we get in the habit of just believing that our prayers don't really matter to God because it's already been settled. He's already had his mind made up. He, he knows how the situation is going to turn out, so why would I take my concerns to him anyway? If God has everything kind of worked out for his purpose and his will, and it's all for my good, then why should I cry out to him at all? Why would, I, why would he change his mind? Why would I want him to change his mind? Well, based upon this passage, it would seem that God does hear the prayers of the righteous, and from time to time, he changes his mind. And for those of us that have declared Jesus as our Savior, we've, we've all been made righteous in God's eyes because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's not always going to work out like it did in this story, unfortunately. Maybe the tragedy in your life doesn't get reversed. But time and time again, the Bible says that we should be crying out to God and seeking refuge in him. We're told to cast our cares upon him and, and rely on him. And the fact is that we serve a living God, and he's one that hears our pleas and our cries, and he has the ability to do something about it. He has the ability to do miracles and reverse circumstances. And more than anything, 
We should be relying on the living God and asking him to raise the spiritually dead people that are around us. Raise them back to life, Lord. Young boy in the story, he, he's back, but he eventually dies again. We go to the New Testament, Lazarus is brought back by Jesus, eventually dies again. But what every single person needs is to be raised up forever spiritually by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And as followers of Christ, it's our mandate, it's our command to be seeking out those that don't know the life-changing power of Jesus and sharing it with them. Like Elijah, we need to be crying out to God on behalf of these people, praying that we, they would be spiritually resurrected. We need to have the same sense of desperation that Elijah has here, that crying out for the people that we love. And unfortunately, I fear that if Elijah had the attitudes of some of us, he might have just left the woman and the son, her son behind after he died. I, I got what I needed. I got fed. I'm good. I, I, I can just go on. I, I mean, I have a relationship with God already anyway. So I, I mean, I'm good. I got my own things to take care of. I got my next place to go. Friends, we simply cannot continue to stand back and allow the spiritually dead around us to continue living that way. We must begin to rely on the living God who, raised the, who raises the dead to guide us and show us the, those in our lives that we need to be sharing the gospel with. Show me, God. Show me anew who I need to be sharing your gospel with. And so this morning, my question to you is, how is your prayer life? How is your prayer life? And my guess is that for most of us, the answer that immediately comes to mind is, uh, not as good as it should be, or non-existent, could be better. I would challenge all of us this morning to start applying the lessons that we've learned from Elijah and, and applying it to our own life, apply it to our prayer life and the time we spend with God. Because we must believe what God has said and know that all of his promises are dependable and worthy to be boldly proclaimed. We must trust God to give us our daily bread. Go to him daily and ask him to provide for us. He may not give us all that we want, but he's going to give you all that you need. We must rely on the living God who's capable of raising the dead. Go to him with your pain and anguish, your questions and your hurts, knowing that he's capable of doing something about it and changing the situation. And we must cry out to him on behalf of the spiritually dead around us. My hope is that these lessons will change our prayer lives from could be better to I have seen the amazing work of Jesus Christ in my life and those around me because of these lessons. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the story of Elijah and that we can see just a man of intense faith and intense prayer that uh, in the situations of tragedy that the first thing he does is go to you. And he cries out to you. And so, Father, I pray that we would learn to, to, to trust what you say and proclaim it, trust you for our needs, and rely on you to change lives. Father, I pray this message would not just go in some sort of file in our mind uh, or just leave us, but that this would really sit on our hearts. And that we would look for those that are spiritually dead around us and say, this isn't okay anymore, and start crying out to you for them. So Father, I just, I pray as we leave this place that we would be, have a renewed fire, that the Holy Spirit would be within us and that we would do some amazing things in the lives of those around us because of you. And it's your name we pray, amen. This morning as we wrap things up, some of you might have a decision to make. Maybe you are the one that's spiritually dead and you feel the tug of Jesus on your heart and you need to be resurrected to begin living your life with him and for him. And if that's something you feel like Jesus is pour, pulling you towards, I would encourage you to listen to that today. Don't wait any longer. Come forward this morning to give your life to him and be baptized as a sign of your commitment to him. Maybe you've been baptized and you need to find a community of believers to, to help you maintain your commitment to him and, and, and help you live your life for him, help you serve him. And if so, we would love to have you become a member of our community here at Gateway Christian Church. Or maybe you just feel like you've been dealing with a lot lately. There's been a lot going on in your life, a lot of hard stuff, thing after thing. Christian or not, that's a hard thing to go through sometimes. And so maybe you just need some prayer this morning. And so Joel will be down, and I'll be here, and we would love to, to talk with you and pray with you, whatever you might need. 
Whatever it is, you can come down front here and we'll help you with whatever, is Je whatever Jesus is putting on your heart. So as we sing our final song, will you please stand up and sing with us?